Hello everyone, this is Iris Trivia, and today we're continuing our deal about the Governor of Zen Let's Talk Lore series with episode 4, titled Internal Focus. Before we get started, here's the answer to our trivia question from our previous episode, and be sure to stay tuned for a new trivia question at the end of this episode. Now we ended last time as we covered Liu Bell's multiple failed attempts to expand his influence outside the Jin province, and hopefully that dispelled any misconceptions about Liu Bell being just a passive observer to the chaos beyond his borders during his reign as the governor of the Jin province. However, the reason why Liu Bell is often portrayed with this misrepresented image is mainly due to his focus on internal development and his passive interactions with his neighbor to the north in Cao Cao, who at this point was the regent for the new imperial court formed in Xuchang. Now in terms of internal development of the Jin province, the single greatest accomplishment of Liu Bel's reign as governor is that Liu Bel brought peace and stability to a large part of the province in a time when most regions of China were constantly engulfed in chaos. This was particularly impressive given how the Jin province was located in a hotly contested centralized location, and Liu Bao achieved this largely through empowering a few strong local gentry clans, as they were oftentimes the same ones who would otherwise cause trouble against the authorities. Therefore, by relying on them to rule their local region, and farther strengthen the tie with them through political marriages and official acknowledgments such as appointments to key posts, Nobel was able to build up his own authority inside the Jin province with their support. Complementing this with Nobel's frequent tributes to the imperial court, regardless of the region in charge, Nobel was able to reinforce his growing authority and reputation within the Jin province with official mandates and imperial court titles which in turn gave him more credibility with the gentry clans inside the Jin province who continued to support him. Now the downside of this was that these few dominant gentry clans held outsized political sways within Nobel's court, which would eventually lead to his succession crisis and the surrender to Cao Cao after his death. But given how Nobel had to disguise himself just to get to his post in the Jin province in the first place, this trade-off was more than acceptable and fair, as without these dominant gentry clans, Nobel would never have ended up as the governor of the Jin province. Then leveraging off this state of peace and stability, the Jin province became one of the most attractive places for refugees during this time period, in particular refugees who were scholars, as Nobel extensively built schools throughout the province and implemented policy to subsidize scholars in need. One observer even went as far as comparing the schools in the Jin province under Liu Bao's reign to the likes and scale of the imperial school, or Tai Xue, in the capital, as they would eventually earn the nickname of Tai Xue of the South. All in all, it was said that over a thousand renowned scholars would either temporarily or permanently make the Jin province their home during this turbulent period, with one of the most famous refugees being none other than Zhuge Liang. Additionally, Nobel's promotion of education also had the effect of cultural preservation, as he was able to restore many of the books lost during the burning of Luoyang, and built quite a collection of rare texts as well as new works by the numerous scholars residing inside the Jin province at the time. This further helped to build Nobel's fame and prestige throughout the land, but sadly, none of this would matter from a military perspective, especially as Cao Cao continued to grow stronger after taking control of the emperor in 196. And speaking of the emperor, Liu Bao's actions during the emperor's escape from Chang'an have to be examined as he too had a chance to get involved, as prior to Cao Cao's involvement, Emperor Liu Xie was protected by and under the control of General Dong Cheng and warlord Zhang Yang as they first made a return to the former capital of Luoyang, hoping to rebuild the city and establish the court there. At the time, they were still fending off attacks from the pursuing armies of Li Jue and Guo Si, and had no supplies. So Grand Tutor Zhao Qi actually traveled to the Jin province asking Liu Bao for help. Now Liu Bao, being an imperial relative, 
and someone who have repeatedly demonstrated his loyalty to the crown and the imperial court with his frequent tributes, did not hesitate one bit as he would send troops, food, and even supplies to help rebuild the palace in Luoyang. And had Emperor Dosia been able to reestablish the court in Luoyang and regain independent rule, or even some resemblance of power, Liu Bao would have been surely rewarded handsomely for his contributions. But due to factors beyond Liu Xie and Liu Bao's control, Cao Cao ended up convincing the emperor to flee with him to Xuchang, as it became apparent that the likes of Yang Feng, Zhang Yang, and Dong Cheng all had their own personal agendas when it came to protecting or in reality controlling the emperor. Unfortunately for Liu Xie, his new savior Cao Cao was no different, as Liu Xie would remain a puppet emperor in the new imperial court formed in Xucheng under Cao Cao's control. Now in hindsight, many might argue that Liu Bao perhaps could have taken action against Cao Cao at this point, as Cao Cao was not yet as dominant as he would become, but two things prevented this. First, and most importantly, Liu Bao had a strong desire to remain loyal to the emperor, and thus indirectly to the imperial court, as we have already seen him repeatedly submit to the court, whether it was Dong Zhuo as regent, or Li Zhu and Guo Si as co-regents, or even now with Cao Cao as the new regent. And this diplomatic approach has landed Liu Bao immense returns, as Dong Zhuo first made him the prefect of the Jin province, before Li Zhu and Guo Si's court named him as the governor, along with a long list of other titles, and now by submitting to Cao Cao's court, Liu Bao would end up being rewarded as well. Furthermore, in the eyes of future historians, Liu Bao would never have to worry about being written off as a potential rebellion prince, as any action he takes against the court could end up making him being labeled as a treasonous prince plotting to put himself on the throne. And if Liu Bao just look at how Gong Sun Zan was able to frame and kill Liu Yu in the north for treason, and how it not only got Liu Yu's entire clan killed, but at least for the time being, Liu Yu's name was also dragged through the mud as a traitor. So there's not a lot of incentive for Liu Bao to take action against Cao Cao. But let's assume for a second that Liu Bao didn't care about this, or perhaps he had the confidence that he could win the conflict against Cao Cao, and once he was the victor, he could obviously write history as he pleases. However, this line of thinking ignores another major issue, which is that there were many other actors vying for power at this time. For example, Yuan Shao in the north looked like the most powerful warlord in China, with control over four provinces. So right after Cao Cao had taken control of the emperor, Liu Bao ended up deciding to play both sides, as he would send tributes to the imperial court and Cao Cao, while at the same time sent envoys to meet with Yuan Shao in the north to discuss a potential alliance in a move that would clearly irate Cao Cao. Another issue that would occupy Liu Bao's attention in 196 was Dong Zhuo's former general, Zhang Ji, who found himself in Nanyang after fleeing the Chang'an region around the same time as the emperor's escape, as he simply wanted to avoid getting dragged into Li Zhu and Guo Si's civil war. But after arriving in Nanyang, Zhang Ji and his army were short on supplies, so they tried to take the city of Rang, in Nanyang in hopes of seizing the supplies stored inside the city and establish a base for themselves there. Unfortunately, during this attack, Zhang Ji was struck by an arrow and lost his life, forcing his nephew, Zhang Xiu, to call off the attack and retreat. Yes, if this sounds like deja vu, it is because this is exactly what happened to the Sun clan, where Sun Jian was struck and killed by arrows and his nephew, Sun Ben, had to call off the attack. Unlike that time, Liu Bao took pity on Zhang Xiu, perhaps because Liu Bao and Zhang Ji shared ties with Dong Zhuo, as instead of chasing Zhang Xiu out of the Jin province, Liu Bao took Zhang Xiu in and gave him the city of Van to garrison and resupplied his forces on the condition that he would defend Van in case Cao Cao attacks, as Van was located near the northern borders shared with Cao Cao. Sure enough, in the following year, Cao Cao would launch his first southern campaign against the Jin province, and Zhang Xiu would become his first obstacle. At the time, even though Zhang Xiu owed his position to Liu Bao's kindness, he had no intentions of sacrificing himself 
for the security of Liu Biao and the Jin province, as he would end up voluntarily surrendering the city of Wan and his entire force to Cao Cao, even before the battle had commenced. Now, what happened next was the infamous incident with Lady Zhou, as on the night of Zhang Xiu's surrender, Cao Cao's lust for Zhang Xiu's widowed aunt, Lady Zhou, would end up enraging Zhang Xiu, which in turn motivated Cao Cao to plot for Zhang Xiu's life. At this point, fearing that Cao Cao would kill him, Zhang Xiu went back on his words and rallied his troops to ambush Cao Cao's unsuspecting forces in the middle of the night. This ambush would almost kill Cao Cao, who would luckily escape at the cost of the life of his eldest son, Cao Ang, who would give up his horse to his father after Cao Cao's own steed was struck down by arrows. Additionally, Cao Cao's nephew, Cao Anmin, and Cao Cao's chief bodyguard, Dian Wei, would both give their lives fighting to the death in order to buy time for Cao Cao to escape. Cao Cao would eventually regroup with his army and fend off Zhang Xiu's attack, as Zhang Xiu would return to being Liu Bao's vassal, while Cao Cao would leave behind General Cao Hong to defend the borders against Zhang Xiu and Liu Bao, as there would be numerous skirmishes on the Jin province borders from 197 to 198. And with that, our episode here is going to come to an end, as we'll continue next time to discuss Liu Bao's actions during the Battle of Guandu and the rival of Liu Bei in the Jin province. So hopefully you all have enjoyed this episode enough to consider subscribing to the channel for more content like this on Three Kingdoms history, or support the channel by leaving a comment below, or simply hit that like button, as our next episode for this series will drop once this video hits 300 likes. And as always, I'll see you all then. Bye.